We are very pleased to once again uh, have had Dr. Tuttle and Dr. Hay. Dr. Tuttle from uh, Memorial in New York and Dr. Hay from uh, someplace in the middle of the country, Minnesota, Mayo Clinic, uh, accept our invitation to uh, be discussants in this thyroid cancer session. And um, thank you to the uh, fellows who submitted cases. And uh, we'll get started. So if uh, VJ will come up first. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> if, if you don't start, we're, yep. we won't stop. <laughs> I'm from St. Louis University. Um, for the case as a 67, this was in 2005 when she was 67. She's a 67 year old female who was seen initially by the ENT sur surgeons for a left neck mass. This was in July 2005. She denied any symptoms of dysphagia or dysphonia, and past medical history was significant only for hypertension, and family history is negative for any history of thyroid cancer. Physical exam done by the ENT was significant by, for, for a left neck mass and a palpable left supraclavicular lymph node. A CT scan subsequently showed bilateral lung nodules. FNA of the left paratracheal mass was diagnostic for papillary thyroid cancer. She underwent total thyroidectomy with level 4 lymph node removal, August 2005, and pathological staging at that time was T1, N1, B, M, X, and AJCC stage 4A. She had a thyroid hormone withdrawal total body scan in October with the TSH at that point being 200, which showed abnormal tracer activities in the thyroid bed area, including a satellite lesion in the left inferior aspect of the neck, left lower lung, right middle lung, and liver dome. At this, point, at this point, she received 150 Icuris radioactive iodine treatment with I131, and she was started on levothyroxine, and the dose titrated up to 88. Dr. Tuttle, any questions, or do you want me to continue at this point? How sizable is this lady, kilogram-wise? Probably like 60 kilos. See the smallish dose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with, when you see the radioactive iodine scans, well, the first things that come to mind is what sizes are we dealing with? Um, so the radioactive iodine, these days, a lot of times they're merged with CT scans. But when you start telling me about somebody that has REI avidity in the neck, REI avidity in the lungs and the bones, one of the things I want to know is what sizes are we dealing with? Because if we've got a great big lung metastasis, I may have to do something about that. A great big bone metastasis, I might need to do something else, surgery, external beam radiation, as opposed to just a little focal uptake. And the second thing I'd want to know is you say the radioactive iodine is positive in a couple of places in the lungs. Do those match up with what we're seeing on the CT scan? Or is this one of those ladies that's got 35 places in the lungs and two of them light up and everybody calls them positive? So <clears throat> it's hard to sort of describe verbally, but in my head I'd want to see the scans match up the radioactive iodine with sizes. So in large part we'd be doing CTs or MRIs to sort of correlate size with the REI avidity. So my friend needs a helpline from you. More information. I'd like to phone a friend. <laughs> well, to give more information, it's, it's been already a long case, so I had to cut back on a lot of it here. Um, this is, it's not clearly mentioned in any of the results if the lesions that light up are basically the same lesions that were seen on the CT scan. And that part of the controversy continues further down our discussion as well. And to return to the surgery, mm -hmm. the central compartment wasn't entered. No, it was a level four lymph node. Level six? Yeah, no, they did a level, just a level four. So the central compartment, mm -hmm. level six, wasn't yes. touched? Yes, wasn't touched. Interesting. So, so that's, I mean, th that's an odd surgery. Um, to Level four is beside the neck on the right-hand side. So, the, you know, by and large, we teach, if you're going to do total thyroidectomy and clean out the central neck, that's level six. That's those pretracheal and paratracheal lymph nodes that we're doing. If you're out in level four, that generally means you've got some bulky lymph nodes and you'd be doing two, three, four, you know, that whole neck dissection on the side. Uh, that doesn't always happen, and you just got the data that you got. This is the reality of doing these consults. 
But even as you begin to go through these things, we're starting to pick up some things that seem a little bit odd. There's a certain pattern that should happen. So we're not going to be surprised if you tell us that there's still some lymph nodes that have to be dealt with that you didn't kill with 35 mm -hmm. doses of radioactive iodine. Go ahead. Yeah. I agree. Beware of the neck. Yeah. <laughs> a repeat thyroid hormone scan in March 2006 showed a new lesion in the medial aspect of the left mid-lung left mediastinum and the previously described left supraclavicular and the pulmonary lesions in the lateral aspect and the liver lesion had resolved on the scan. However, she continued to have elevated TG and a PET scan was done which demonstrated disease progression with a new lesion in the right upper lung and progressive increase in size of the left supraclavicular lymph node and based on these results, she received another 200 of radioactive iodine. Okay, under the told you so category. So we're headed down the wrong pathway. So what, the, what we missed in this is what was that structural disease? If we would have done a CT scan or MRI of the neck, we would have seen right after that first dose of radioactive iodine, in fact, five minutes after the first surgery, that she still had bulky lymph nodes, that radioactive iodine is not going to destroy. God knows I hate to agree with Dr. Shaha, but there are parts of this that he's right, that this is a surgical disease. This is why Dr. Hay was asking, did you clean out the neck? Did we do level six? So we make this mistake all the time of trying to use radioactive iodine over and over to kill structural disease. So we're not surprised now that you're going to give another 200 millicuries. You may see a little ditzel or datzel mm -hmm. flop up there. Uh, but in all likelihood, we're not going to cure the disease going in this direction. And part of the problem was endocrine was consulted after the surgery. So endocrine was not involved. The patient saw ENT, had surgery, and was seen by endocrine for, at the point of levothyroxine replacement. We forgive you. <laughs> Follow up PET scan. That's the ENT people. <laughs> Follow up PET scan um, in August 2006 showed the subcentimeter lymph node just medial to the left sternocleidomastoid and increased in intensity since the prior PET scan. And this lymph node was not appreciated on the radioactive iodine scan. There were, there were also new nodular infiltrates on the PET in the right upper lung and right lung base, suggestive of malignancy. Subsequently, she received another 250 molecules of radioactive iodine, totaling a dose of 600 thus far. She, she was continued to be observed, and in August 2007, a thyroid withdrawal scan again showed bilateral lower lung metastatic disease. And at this point, dosimetry was done, and based on the dosimetric calculations, she received 400 millicuries radioactive iodine, now totaling 1,000 millicuri, and had a follow-up scan with a TSH of 197 when the thyroglobin was 144, and the scan still showed bilateral lower lung activity unchanged from the previous scan in August 2007, but bilateral lower lung metastasis. She was continued on levothyroxine 100 daily, and the TSH suppressed was 0 0.05 with a TG of 1. She was continued to be observed. Stop, stop. Sorry. We're going to yeah. stop. Yeah. <laughs> you have got to stop yeah. this madness. Dr. Hay? It's obvious that in St. Louis they play some baseball, but they do like our radio ID. <laughs> I mean, when does it stop? I mean, what good is it, is it that we're doing here? Are we really making these lung metastasis regress? Or are we playing the game of making thyroglobulin disappear? Um, what do you think we'll buy? Yeah. Time to get back to the neck? Uh, yes, eventually, eventually we'll get back to the neck to get this unresectable disease. What's, what's happening here is that the, we, we keep giving doses of radioactive iodine because the post-therapy scan is positive. Uh, I wish I could say this is an unusual case. I see this every month. And they're usually referred to me because we can do dosimetry and we can do high-dose therapy. And after somebody gets 600 inappropriate millicuries, they want me to give another 500 inappropriate millicuries. Dr. Hayes' point is exactly right. When you give a dose radioactive iodine, you have to ask, what good did I do? Was there any therapeutic effect? Did I shrink anything? Thus far, we've heard about nothing shrinking. We've heard about progressive disease the entire time. You made a couple places that were RAI Abbott resolve. No, you didn't. You just killed the RAI uptake in those couple places. Those lymph nodes are still there. They're PET positive. So when you're given that second dose radioactive iodine, it's like anything else in medicine. Look back and say, what good did I do? 
Did I shrink something? It is incredibly unusual to shrink this big disease when you're up at three and four and 500, 600 millicures. Somerset's published a couple different times that if he didn't get an effect by 600, he didn't get an effect with 8,000. So be very reluctant when we're in this pattern. And it's always this, I'm gonna give a dose because the patient has progressive and the last time the scan was a little bit positive so I had to get again. Last point is, if it takes you 400 millicuries to get a positive scan, it means the lesional dosimetry is terrible. It takes about that much radioactive iodine to get a picture. It takes about that much radioactive iodine to cause a therapeutic tumor cytal effect. So this pattern happens over and over. Progressive disease, it's in the lungs, scans positive, keep treating. So we've got to stop that. At least uh, treat the radioactive iodine. On a practical note, I mean, we all come to this meeting, we all hear about the wonders of dosimetry, and most of us have institutions where physicists are too lazy or patients are too busy. So we've never done dosimetry in our existence to an extent. However, I think since the beginning of time at the Mayo Clinic, since the beginning of the rectilinear scanner and the ability to take uptakes on foci within the, the body, I think there is something that every nuclear medicine department in the nation could easily do which is to say that this lady, when she came along, had 3% uptake in the right lung, 2% in the left. Next time it was 0.2%. Next time it was 0.001%. And do the maths. You probably get more radiation flying to Palm Springs than giving 400 millicuries when your uptake is visible but impossibly low. So I think the whole, dare I say it, reflex of hitting the impossible battle uh, with more and more and more radioiodine gets less and less effective. And frankly, uh, I don't know much about these new drugs as much as he does, but maybe we should have gone back to the drugs about 400 millicuries if they're available in St. Louis, which I believe they are, they are. Um, because I think either we leave the lady alone or we do something more inventive than giving people more and more radioiodine because it really doesn't work terribly well. And that's precisely what happens. So she is basically left alone, just observed and had no symptoms. However, last year, she had an episode of hemoptysis and CD showed some bilateral pulmonary nodules, but when she was treated with pneumonia, for the pneumonia, the pulmonary infiltrates resolved. A subsequent neck ultrasound um, done, did not show any nodules or lymph nodes on the ultrasound. And most recently, a couple of months back, her TSH is still suppressed with a TG of 3.5, and she's currently on levothyroxine of 112. So she's basically left alone for the last three, four years, and she's stable with residual disease. So the question is, is there something else we can do at this point? So how else can you hurt this lady? Is it, is it, what do we have? I got lots of stuff I can do to hurt her. We got lots of good drugs and stuff. Think about this story. It, it's not surprising that she's been stable for a long time. Early on in this story, she had distant metastasis and she had a PET scan that was barely positive. That, she never was very RAI avid, so it's non-RAI avid, but not very PET positive. And many of these patients with distant metastasis will change very minimally over three, four, or five years. So I'm not surprised we're sitting where we are. I don't think the radioactive iodine did anything except give her a dry mouth and probably raise her chance of leukemia if she lives for another 30 years. So when we say leave these patients alone, we don't mean go away and don't ever come back. We mean take your endocrine hat off and treat this like it's, you're an oncologist. The follow-up for this lady is CT scans every once in a while because the decision to do something else is gonna be structural disease progression. The decision to put her on one of these tyrosine kinases, you guys have heard us talk about serafinib and all the ibs, serafinibs, motesinibs, your mama's ib, it's all the ibs. All of the indications to do that is structural disease progression. The indication to operate on her neck is macroscopic disease or structural disease progression. So her follow-up should be TG every six months or every year, a CT scan of the neck and chest or whatever your choice of scans are, every year, 18 months, two years, depending on how progressive she is. What we're missing is we don't know how progressive she is. We're missing several CT scans over the years because if you knew the stuff in the lungs was essentially the same size as five years ago. She doesn't have to come to the Mayo Clinic every three months to support Dr. Hayes' lifestyle. She can come once a year and just be evaluated and followed that way. So this is one of those, early on, on that very first scan, we asked, what's the size of stuff? What's the structural? If we would have done that, that would have told us how to follow up over time. So right now, I think you watch her, 
and your indications to do something is structural progression in the neck or structural progression in the chest. Okay. Thank you. I think some literary giants in former days wrote papers in the annals about La Belle Compromise. And personally, I think it's wonderful that endocrinologists don't do a lot of harm by thyroid hormone suppression. But I still personally think that the iodine-deficient mouse model of the 1950s bears no relationship to the postmenopausal women of America today. And that this sort of desire of endocrinologists to whack down the TSH to as low as Carl Spencer can measure is a bit above and beyond common sense. Meaning, I don't think for a minute this lady who's got umpteen nodules in various places of her body will be worse off if she's a 0.4, which would satisfy most biochemists and nurse practitioners, rather than 0 0.3, 0 0.1, or 0 0.001. Because frankly, I think this is the little water pistol f fighting a fire, you know, thyroid hormone suppression. I mean, it does magical things in children's books and in the Cleveland Clinic in the 1950s with thyroid feeding making lung metastasis disappear. But I think since Tuttle grew white hair, I don't think people have taken thyroid feeding and made metastasis disappear anymore. I don't think these are magic tricks that are sanctioned by the American thyroid community. I agree. I mean, the, Bernadette Biondi and Dave Cooper wrote a really nice paper, sort of a review that says, how do you balance the benefit of heavy-duty suppression versus the risk? In, in people that have osteoporosis and atrial fibrillation, no, I wouldn't keep her TSH zero. I'm perfectly happy at 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. I gradually back off, and if the, TS, if the TG jumps from 1 to 800, then I go, well, maybe I need a little bit more. It doesn't ever happen. So I think on those, when you, you got a disease that's not going to kill her, maybe, because she's already in her 60s and it's not progressive, you know, you don't want to give her AFib or osteoporosis. So backing off, I think, is perfectly fine. I used to have a like, slide. This is actually us actually doing our own work. We, we don't really take histories. That's your guy's job. And, the, and you read it all written out to us. So here we're having to like write it out. It's very frustrating. I will, I will tell you the other funny part. As I sit here and watch, as we listen to these stories, both of us are writing down the same things. What we're writing down is age, information about stage, information about size. So you guys are using a lot of words, and I'm, I'm sitting watching the notes that Ian's making. It's all this risk stratification stuff to predict it. So it's kind of fun. And he's drawing funny pictures. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Uh, I'm Donna from the University of Western Ontario in Canada. Um, so the case that I have, uh, it's a 48-year-old female that uh, I saw in clinic. Um, at the time, it was a follow-up when I saw her. Um, she presented originally with an incidental discovery of bilateral thyroid nodules on palpation by her primary care physician. She underwent FNA of both these nodules uh, with final pathology showing a benign nodule and uh, inadequate sample from the second lesion. She was then referred to uh, head and neck surgery and the decision was made to pursue total thyroidectomy because she has a very significant family history of papillary thyroid cancer. Um, pathology came back and revealed a, non, a dominant uh, benign herthal cell nodule and several foci of PTC limited to the right lobe measuring 5, 4, and 1 millimeter. There was no evidence of extrathyroidal extension nor lymphovascular invasion, and resection margins were clear of tumor. She did not receive any remnant ablation and was maintained on levothyroxine with a gold TSH in the lower half of the normal range. So a little bit about her family history. Um, so there's a significant history of papillary thyroid cancer that affects three out of six children. Um, I should mention, as an addition to this uh, uh, history, the first sibling, um, a sister, was diagnosed with PTC at the age of 22. Um, all of her siblings have been screened, and there's a bit of a correction to that, including a brother. And all um, of, the, of those that have been screened, and by screen I mean they've, they've had ultrasounds done of their thyroid glands, um, three have confirmed malignancy, and two were noted to have thyroid nodules um, and have had total thyroid uh, thyroidectomies with benign pathology. Um, the patient's father passed away from renal cell carcinoma at the age of 51, and her mother, who is alive, has a history of benign thyroid nodule as well as both Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and I should mention as well, all the siblings that have had confirmed uh, papillary thyroid cancer have had low risk for recurrence um, and are alive. Um, so she is now two years after her diagnosis. So she was diagnosed originally at the age of 46. 
um, and has been doing well. Her unstimulated thyroid globulin levels have always remained low, and her antithyroid globulin antibodies always remain undetectable. Neck ultrasounds have never revealed any disease recurrence nor suspicious adenopathy, and the stimulated thyroid globulin level from March 2010 was low. Move on with the uh, questions. Or? Okay, so um, this was a question she actually had for us in the clinic. Should her children be screened for papillary thyroid cancer? If so, what would be the best approach, a best time to, to screening? Okay, so we'll stop there. So is there any such thing as familial papillary thyroid cancer? No? Yes? Hands, please. How many say yes? How say yes? Good. How many say no? How many don't care? How many are asleep? That's fantastic. We, we used to say there's no such thing as familial papillary, and there probably is such a thing as familial papillary. When we look in our numbers, it's about 4% of my patients that have multiple family members, three family members or four family members. It tends to skip generations. It comes and goes. It scares the heck out of families. And you end up with whole families like this that have their thyroids taken out for tons of benign disease. Uh, they're entirely happy until somebody gets a benign thing taken out and ends up with a trach or a recurrent laryngeal nerve or dies in surgery. So this is a family that's being fed uh, information that says we're worried about this. This is a bad family thyroid cancer. I, I, the data out there is split. There are some people that think these familial cases are more aggressive. That certainly is not our experience. Um, they seem to behave very close to what we'd seen before. They often get kicked off with one family member that had bad disease, which is just what scares everybody else into being screened. And so you end up with that. So by and large, I'm very reassuring to these moms. I say, no, I don't want you to do an ultrasound on the kids. Um, tell the pediatrician that there's some thyroid cancer in the family. Have it evaluated. If you're a lady, have a GYN doctor feel your neck. If you develop a nodule, we would take it seriously. But the trouble with going out and chasing everybody with ultrasounds is you're going to find way too many false positives. And this is a family that if you find one, two millimeter anything, there is nobody going to stop that person from going to surgery. So our approach is to slow down, try to be reassuring, and not rush toward lots of other screening. Right now there are groups, including the NCI group, that are trying to collect people that have three or four family members to do gene studies. And about once every five years somebody publishes a study and says, we got the gene, and then it turns out not to be. So it's out there, but I think you just largely have to be reassuring in these patients. Uh, I tend to agree. I mean, in our Mayo Clinic cohort of patients, it's always been over the years 3 to 5 percent. And our attitude at the Mayo Clinic certainly has not been to suggest to people that they need to screen like a multiple and endocrine neoplasia circumstance. And I personally know of no convincing evidence in the literature that somebody who is a mother or an aunt or a grandmother with papillary cancer is worse off than anybody else, meaning the size, the grade, the extent of the disease is much more important than the family history. Now, I'm a little confused here. It says, family history of papillary cancer affecting three out of six children, all siblings screened except for a brother. Um, is that, that true? Was the, the correction is they've all been screened. No, but how many papillary cancers have been proven in the, in the kindred? Yes. How many? Yeah. Uh, pardon? How many, how many members of the family have Three. papillary cancer? Three. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I personally don't think it makes a lot of difference to this person's outcome. And given the fact that it's a multicentric, maximum five millimeter papillary thyroid cancer, independent of who did the operation, ENT or otherwise, I'm delighted that in Western Ontario they don't give radioiodine. I would advise the Ontario government they shouldn't waste their time and money spending recombinant TSH time stimulating thyroglobulins and something like this. I don't think this is a national priority to save people from five millimeter papillary cancers that we wish we hadn't found, quite honestly, and I don't think really is a very dramatic or worrisome disease. But anything more, sir? No. I agree. The only other thing, it's the number of people involved in the family is dramatically counts. If you just have one other family member, that's the same as having your neighbor with thyroid cancer. Because uh, statistically, that's just, if you've got two family members, it's the same as having a neighbor or cousin. So to, to be in these real familial studies, you need three at a minimum, if not four. So it seems like all everybody knows somebody that has thyroid cancer, and you're probably related to somebody that has thyroid cancer. So one extra person doesn't count. The real families that I have have five or six or seven family members that are truly in there. So I think in these, you just have to be reassuring. It's really hard because this whole family's been freaked out. They've been freaked out by a ton of endocrinologists. Um, they're all feeding into this. One of them found a cancer, and it's, it's just, you just have to slow the train down. 
Uh, if you do a biopsy and you find something, you're going to have to go to surgery. So mm -hmm. as much as you can, slow them down. And reassure them that if you're wrong, it's okay. If they have a thyroid cancer, you'll find it. It'll pick it up. You're going to be able to treat it. They're low risk. They're not going to come back with anaplastic cancer. So, you know, they always say, can you guarantee I won't have a thyroid cancer? I'm like, no, I can't guarantee you the taxi cab driven by Shaha won't hit you on the way out of here. There's no 100% whatsoever. But if you'll work with me and follow me, come see me once a year. I'll fill your neck once a year. We'll make sure you don't have any lymph nodes. And if we find something, we'll evaluate it. So most of these, I can't say don't do anything and go away because they'll come find one of you guys who'll order an ultrasound. So do it with them. Yes. Yeah, the, the question is, what happens if you have an anaplastic family member? And it, it anecdotally feels like in some of my family members that have had six, seven, eight thyroid cancer patients, there's occasionally an anaplastic story in there. So the, in that sort of situation, though, every family you ever meet that's had mom or dad had an anaplastic, they want their thyroid ultrasound, and if they see anything, they want it out. So this situation, if you see folks with anaplastic, you're going to have this discussion. You have to be very, very reassuring. Um, no, they, there is no data that over-treating that lady is going to do any good at all. Remember, we see thousands of cases of thyroid cancer, thousands of cases with persistent disease, and most of you guys in this room have never seen anybody with anaplastic cancer. So you sort of, what I try to do is, that, yeah, I understand your concern. It's very, very unlikely, and they'll say, well, they said the same thing to mom. Well, yeah, I understand that. So, no, we don't screen the kids, but there is additional pressure from those families to do that. It's just an education process you have to go through with. And I, and I think, you know, it's always worthwhile if one is involved in that circumstance and the big cause of angst in the family is the dreaded anaplasty that killed mother. I, I think anaplasty thyroid cancer is a rare enough bird that usually most pathology departments still have the slides and it's well worthwhile pursuing that further because, frankly, there's a lot of baloney out there that's described as anaplastic thyroid cancer and bad things happen to good people and horrible malignancies that look undifferentiated and spindle cell and nasty are sometimes not anaplastic thyroid cancer. And if you can establish with magical markers nowadays that it was some sort of mesenchymal stem cell nasty sarcoma, then at least the whole notion of getting wee Johnny getting his thyroid out inappropriately too early is off the table. And I think what I'm saying is you really need to pursue anaplastic thyroid cancer diagnosis because they aren't all they're cracked up to be a bit like Rudolf Struma sometimes. Yeah. Absolutely true. So my second question, um, let's say a thyroid nodule or nodules have been found in a family member, should they proceed directly to thyroidectomy? Yes, see, the answer to that is no, because the, the real question of that is, does, does having a family history of thyroid cancer change the pretest probability that that nodule is cancer, right? So if you had a family history of medullary, we'd go, yeah, that would change the pretest probability. So, no, but what I find in these big family histories, if they have a nodule, even a nodule I wouldn't normally biopsy, sometimes they force me to biopsy, I try to talk them out of it. But no, that wouldn't sort of change my decision. Um, in some of these patients, they just can't stand it. They kind of demand to have their thyroid taken out. What I find, though, is if they'll talk to you and your surgeon and have a real, you know, honest talk about it's okay to be wrong, it's okay, it's unlikely we're going to find anything, but we can change our mind in six months, we can change our mind in a year. If you can have them keep their thyroid for a year or two, it kind of settles down. So it's worth the effort, it's worth the time, it just takes a lot of education, takes a lot of information. You need the surgeon, the endocrinologist on the same page with you. Make sure the family practice doctor is not feeding into this. You send the note to them saying, don't worry about it, this is not breast cancer. So you have to deal with the family and the docs. I think similar scary discussions have gone on in our training period in relation to history of radiation. And some of the giants of thyroidology, some of the tallest surgeons in San Francisco, would take a history, Orlo, and say, you've got a history of radiation, and we've got a lumpy neck, we're going to go to total thyroidectomy tomorrow. And many a person has walked away from the discussion and ended up being followed for benign disease without an orlectomy. So I think you can scare the bejeebers out of patients by the way you cast your net. But I think irradiation was the curse of our childhood in thyroidology. I think family history is an, a local flavor, as everything's genetic nowadays, if you can find the damn marker, if you go fishing for it. But realistically, this is a true rarity in papillary thyroid cancer, and we shouldn't really be permitting, really, uh, siblings and children having unnecessary thyroidectomies for benign disease in this day and age. 
when we can do a pretty good job with preoperative pathology to keep most people's thyroids in the neck. I don't think this is a, a, a red flag for inappropriate early thyroidectomy. Okay, and the last question. So does uh, this significant family history confer a pro poorer prognosis and higher risk for recurrence? Yeah, I think it's, it, it, you'll frequently have people say yes. If you ask people in the hallway, well, they say yes, and I tell you, I think the answer is no. It's exactly what Dr. Hayes said, stage for stage, size for size, a micropapillary carcinoma and somebody with a family history is no different than one without it. If it's already spread outside the thyroid, it's no different. So to me, it doesn't convey a higher risk of recurrence, it conveys a higher risk of worry, doesn't change my decision to do follow-up, doesn't change how I do radioactive iodine. So in a practical standpoint, it's the staging, it's the initial presentation that makes the data. That family history doesn't drive me one way or the other. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm Monica Marin. I represent Pete Zendo today. Okay, I'm going for a drink. <laughs> <laughs> she represents Pete Zendo. Ah, fortunately, Dr. Hay has done some Pete Zendo. We're doing good. Go ahead. Let's, we'll make it's it. It's still a cancer, so. You know that the pediatric endocrinologists in this community cannot define when childhood becomes adolescence. So as far as I'm concerned, a 17-year-old who can fight for your country is almost adult, and we would see them tomorrow in our adult clinic. So If they're well insured, we certainly would. That's exactly right. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Okay, so this is a 17-years-old female which presented at 15 years of age with headaches and elevated blood pressure. Uh, her primary care doctor did a CT scan of the abdomen and chest, thinking that she might have a phyochromocytoma. Uh, the um, imaging showed an intraabdominal mass and enlarged uh, anterior, right anterior cervical lymph node. Um, she was referred to surgery for the abdominal mass and had a biopsy which showed a dedifferentiated liposarcoma. Uh, she had the abdominal mass resected as well the cervical lymph node. At the pathology, the lymph node was read as a microscopic papillary thyroid carcinoma, 1.5 millimeters, arising from a benign ectopic thyroid cyst in the neck lymph node, uh, TTF1 and thyroglobulin positive, and P53 positive. Um, she was treated for liposarcoma first. Uh, she received iphosphamide and doxorubicin, and after she finished her chemotherapy, she was referred to endocrinology for further um, work up for presumed papillary thyroid carcinoma. Um, when we first saw her, she was a well-appearing adolescent. Um, she reported that she lost uh, 50 pounds before she was diagnosed, um, but after she received chemotherapy, she regained the weight. Uh, she didn't have any dyspnea, uh, dysphagia, hoarseness, no signs or symptoms of hypo or hyperthyroidism. From past medical history, she was born full term, um, uncomplicated pregnancy, uh, no neonatal problems. She had an insignificant past medical history. She didn't have any history of uh, irradiation of any kind or no in utero exposure to radiation. Uh, in the family history, her maternal grandmother has, um, has had breast cancer. Uh, there is no breast cancer in mom or in mom's generation. Uh, maternal great-grandfather had lung cancer, um, and uh, there was hypothyroidism in maternal aunt, but the rest of the family history was non-significant. Um, 
at our initial exam. Uh, she was well appearing, uh, obese. Um, she the uh, thyroid was normal, um, and she didn't have any lymphadenopathy in the neck. Um, she just had surgical scars, two centimeter uh, surgical scar below the right clavicle, and extensive abdominal surgical scar. Um, any questions so far? How big was the lymph nodal mass in the beginning? Um, actually, I don't have this report. It was done somewhere outside. I couldn't get the report. It almost certainly was a centimeter or two centimeters. I mean, because the way this yeah. comes up, I mean, we see this all the time in the cancer center, that she was getting CT scans for staging of her primary thing. She wasn't getting an ultrasound. And so they probably saw a cystic lymph node out there, that's, or they palpated. So my guess would be the lymph node itself would be a centimeter or two. The focus of cancer inside the lymph node, we don't really know. That, that first, it was 1.5. Oh, 1.5 millimeter. That's yeah, fantastic. Yes, I know. So up in the up. Oh, you don't have in the first paragraph where it says uh, benign ectopic thyroid cyst in a neck lymph node. This was the the report that we've got from the pathologist. That's fantastic because that's a brand new entity. So uh, you <laughs> you heard it here first. The, the reason that comes up is very often in these teenagers, the thyroid cancer in the lymph nodes can look remarkably like normal thyroid tissue. It is very, very well differentiated. So we actually see this mistake made not infrequently. When you have the slides reread, it's no big deal. But that papillary thyroid carcinoma in kids and the lymph nodes can look, you know, as Dr. Lavolsi was saying in her talk, not every papillary cancer has the, the classic nuclear changes. And some of these, if they ignore where it is, can look remarkably like benign thyroid tissue. So my question to Dr. Hay is, so she's presented a case to us with a 1.5 millimeter metastatic thyroid cancer in a lymph node, and yet the thyroid itself is normal. Do you, do you believe the thyroid's normal? Does she have thyroid cancer? What's going on? Well, I suspect that there is a tiny right lower primary. Philosophically, if I was the caring doctor looking after a teenager of ginormous proportions who lost 140 pounds and could still walk... No, this six. is a typo. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. So she wasn't 360 pounds. <laughs> we both circled that. Whoa. That's fantastic. She's 210, but she didn't last one. She must have been down to bones. <laughs> the humane aspects of my endocrine practice would suggest that this young lady is jolly lucky to have got away with this nasty differentiated liposarcoma. The fact that unfortunately we found this lymph node and found one and a half millimeters of badness in it, I'm going to ask Dr. Tuttle how many people he's following with a hitherto unseen primary, because I certainly babysit quite a few people who are adults who we've seen this, the ENT people got all bent out of shape, we did an ultrasound, ultrasound at once, we follow people for seven to ten years, we still haven't found the damn primary and the patient's going to go to their grave with it and I personally am losing any sleep about it. So I think for sure if you want to pass the boards and help the, the, the surgeon be busier and your hospital get paid, sure you can do all sorts of silliness here and take out a, lo a lobe, a whole thyroid, a central compartment, radioiodine ablation, God knows what, but realistically I'm a believer, sorry Ken Berman, I don't believe that biochemical uh, recurrence is a big deal. You know, undetectable stimulated TG is for the birds. This whole idea of endocrinologists playing some sort of exotic computer game that's called papillary cancer equals kill the thyroglobulin molecule is foolish. And before I pack it in, I hope this message gets us across. But in a word, I think this person has an impossible to find disease at the moment and if we wait until it appears, we can treat it when they're 20, 30, 40. But if you said, if you persuaded the parent who's survived the sarcomatous experience that there's a dreaded cancer in the right lobe that could become anaplastic at any moment, which is madness, then for sure, if you go fishing, you may find this microscopic disease and you may be able to take out her thyroid safely. But I think there could be a place for this lady to recover from her dread disease and keep it under observation would be the more humane idea. How many unknown foci of disease in a node like this are you currently following? 10 or 15. So I think we live with it, we go home with it, and the patients are happy with it. 
scarring the neck and operations aren't, don't always go smoothly. And I think if we can't find disease, I don't think endocrinologists should go home and vex themselves because there's a thyroglobulin out there without an answer. Such things go on. If you wait long enough, sometimes the thyroglobins actually go down, even in Italy. So I think, you know, let's watch the, the anatomy, and if a focus appears, we can attack it. Agreed? Yeah. So this is, if you tell everybody outside this room what we said, they'll say that's why they shouldn't let those two talk to you guys. Because <laughs> everybody knows if you have cancer, it has to come out of your neck. Um, we're, we're, Ito did this experiment, right? that you heard this morning about people biopsy-proven small lymph node metastasis that he's watched for 10 years. How many of those people had lymph node metastasis that we didn't know about? Randolph gave you that number, it's 80%. So every papillary microcarcinoma I choose to observe without doing surgery, I am doing this. I'm ignoring lymph node metastasis. So just because somebody found that insignificant speck of thyroid cancer and lymph node metastasis does not make it aggressive, does not make it out of control, makes it worrisome. So what I really do in these guys, and we see this a lot in people that have had a couple cancers, what I do with the family is I say, let's take care of the other cancer first. And we'll worry about that thyroid cancer. I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye on you every year or so. And then after three or four years, I admit to them I really have no intention of treating the thyroid cancer. But if I say that up front, all their doctors get worried. So I think in a lady like this, number one, you've got to find out what's the natural history of this disease that she has. This would be a crime to do a thyroid surgery on this lady and her need more chemo in six months. So you've got to find out what's the natural history of the disease. Number two, I tell her she's got an absolute option. If she's my daughter, I would follow her with an ultrasound. They don't really need one for a year or 18 months, but I bring them back in six months so they feel loved and convinced that nothing's changing. It's perfectly fine. If I'm wrong, some more lymph node mets will grow over the next year or two or five or 15 and will treat it perfectly appropriately. So I think this is one of those that you've got to get away from the one size fits all. You talk to the family. And we follow lots and lots of these folks like this, and they do fine. Yeah. So I would say watch. That's what we choose to do, and family agreed. And where are you from? Oklahoma University. Oak, way to go, Okies. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Doctor, I miss watching it. Doc, wait a minute. This is my partner. Yes, Dr. Fish. <laughs> Yeah, yeah that's, see, that's the issue. So if it, I, I was just trying to think if I ever saw a two-centimeter lymph node that didn't have something in the thyroid. So it, or other nodes. So it, it would be really unusual to paint this exact scenario that only had one big lymph node and nothing else in the middle. I guess technically if I did, I would think about it. But the reason that sort of triggers is if you've got a two-centimeter lymph node, you almost always have other lymph nodes. You have something you can see in there. So in, in a theoretical standpoint, I'd say yes, but in a real practicality, I don't think we'd ever hardly see that. It, but your point is well taken, though, that it's the size of these lymph node metastases that drive the recurrence rates, that these little small things, if something gets to be two or three centimeters, it's already declared itself for whatever reason, intrinsically, external factors, that it's clinically significant, and so all the surgeons would do therapeutic neck dissection. So size, size does drive part of that stuff. Thank you. Oh, be still my heart. Go for it, Aubrey. All right. So I'm Aubrey. I'm from Baylor. I'm doing my research at MD Anderson. So this is a case that we saw in clinic. Um, this is. Oh, I'm sorry. Better. All right, so um, this is a case we saw in clinic at MD Anderson. Um, this is a 59-year-old uh, engineer who uh, had presented just for a uh, consultation. He had already been to uh, three other outside institutions, um, and he came with a small carry-on piece of luggage filled with all of his medical records. Um, and so we just kind of wanted an idea of what to do, what to do next. So I'll try to summarize his, his case as follows and just stop me if you, you have any questions. That was for the panel. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> it didn't look like I'll it. Go ahead. All right. So um, he's in paragraph three, he's, he's so, so three already. <laughs> you want to know what we were doing? We saw the first line that says retinal metastasis, and he says, must be a big one. I said, must be something else. Is this a follicular or is this a herthal? So there's, there's a pattern of what you, you know, they're odd cases, they're unusual cases, but the last, I've got two or three of these folks with retinal metastasis, and what they had in common is they were follicular tumors, they were herthal cell carcinomas, 
They usually had bulky disease. Otherwise, they had brain metastasis. So we're already scanning down to see if this is the kind of case that we're talking about. So you'll find when you ask old guys how you do this, we're looking for patterns. There are certain patterns that you see over and over and over again. You guys are used to those patterns in hypothyroidism. You're used to it in hyperthyroidism because you see a lot of those. Weird guys in practices like us see enough of these that even these odd things begin to pick up a pattern. So what he's underlining as he's going down is looking for, is there something different about this case that's going to change how we would normally handle it? So I, it's interesting to see how he's going. I don't agree with that. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So the case is uh, the patient initially reports that while he was lifting a heavy object, um, he felt some severe left-sided uh, eye pain. Uh, blurriness of vision. He went to the emergency room um, and the following day was seen by ophthalmology and he was found to have a large retinal bleed. Um, several days later, once the bleeding had stopped, he actually had some imaging of the orbit which revealed left-sided uh, retinal tumor, with, which at the time ophthalmology felt was most likely had the characteristics of a metastatic foci. So um, unfortunately, nothing was really done about the, the, the retinal mass at that time, and they went searching for, for a primary tumor. Um, so, okay, they so, so this is classic mistake. So I know we all train as, as endocrinologists, um, but this is an oncologic emergency. Uh, this is no different than having a spine met with impending cord compression. This is no different than having a brain metastasis. This is a big deal. So this workup can't take three weeks. It can't take six weeks. This is something that you call your oncologist and the guys. These are people that need to be seen in very, very short order. Um, otherwise, things progress and things grow. So there are very few thyroid emergencies. But as soon as we figure out that this is thyroid, this is going to be one of those that can't wait for a month to get the MD Anderson. They can't wait for a month. We all have emails. We have phone numbers. So already I'm thinking, how quickly are we going to get through this evaluation? So that, just to give you a time frame, that was in November. By the time he actually um, had a dedicated MRI of the, the orbit, that was in February, uh, which showed an 8-millimeter enhancing lesion along the inferior margin of the fourth ventricle and a 12-millimeter left-sided retinal mass. Um, CT, what they were sort of pan scanning him at this point to figure out where the primary was. CT demonstrated multiple non calcified pulmonary nodules uh, ranging up to 12 millimeters, uh, left hilar adenopathy, and what looked like a 5.5 centimeter right thyroid mass with tracheal deviation. Um, they there was some delay in his care at this outside institution, and so it wasn't until March, which was about four months after the retinal bleed, that he ended up getting a biopsy of one of the lung nodules, which demonstrated metastatic Herthel cell carcinoma. Um, finally, in April, he uh, underwent total thyroidectomy and neck dissection, uh, which pathology demonstrated uh, two foci of Herthel cell carcinoma, one in the right lobe with a largest diameter of 7.5 centimeters and one on the other side with 1.2 centimeters in diameter. Uh, with capsular invasion and vascular invasion, he was T3M at the point that time. Um, so at the same time, um, they noticed that uh, he had what looked like spinal metastases as well, so he underwent a laminectomy. Um, and resection for what also proved to be intradural extramedullary metastatic Herthel cell carcinoma. Um, they gave him radioactive iodine, um, 152 millicuries, um, and post-treatment scan really only demonstrated uptake in the thyroid bed, but he had known proven metastatic disease in other places. So what, um, what was the likelihood that radioactive iodine is going to help this guy? A lot? Can, can you hurt him with radioactive iodine? Yeah, to, to do radioactive iodine, you have to do what? Raise his? TSH is called thyroid stimulating hormone. If you've got a lump in the back of your eye that's thyroid cancer, can you think of a worse reason to raise somebody's TSH? So in these guys, that, that's why this whole pattern thing kicked up, that as soon as you call me and say, I've got a metastatic a Herthel cell carcinoma to the eye, the first thing we say is, all right, you've got disease a lot of other places. Radioactive iodine is not the first thing that you grab for. Somebody wrote to choose your battle zones here. The, the, if you've got a brain met, we're going to deal with it. If you've got a met behind the eye, it needs to be dealt with. If you've got a spinal met, it needs to be dealt with. 
Um, we deal with those one at a time. The last thing that's worrying this guy is a seven and a half centimeter tumor in his neck, unless it's rapidly growing. You've got a few weeks to deal with that. So the sequence here is dealing with these areas that are, could be catastrophic and areas that when you get around to using radioactive iodine, you want taken care of, treated, handled, external beam surgeries, so that when you raise the TSH, you don't have acute swelling. So the sequence in these guys is everybody wants to rush to surgery and everybody wants to rush to do the radioactive iodine, but the sequence is let's find the disease that's likely to hurt you, again, thinking like an oncologist, and then working through those areas. And then after that, at the very end, trying to dose radioactive iodine to see if you're going to do any good. So he had, at some point after um, June of, of this year, he had switched institutions. He still hadn't presented to Anderson, but um, when he switched institutions, um, they actually, at that point, decided to, uh, due to increasing intraocular pressure, they decided to uh, give him external beam radiation to the left eye um, for the tumor there. Um, so by the time he presented to us, uh, he had been to four different places, like I mentioned, and this is kind of what, what we were seeing at the time. So we, our initial plan was really to uh, do some extensive restaging um, and then kind of go from there. So um, we were most concerned, given his past medical history, um, about the intracranial lesions that up until this point did not seem to have been addressed. Um, in addition to that, we were concerned about the extent of disease in his spine or what other metastases may be. So we did MRI of the brain, which demonstrated uh, multiple intracranial lesions, um, including the stable 8 millimeter lesion in the fourth ventricle, which we had seen before. MRI of the spine showed that he had multifocal disease um, uh, and a very prominent lytic lesion in T5 with epidural extension um, and encroachment into the foramen. No frank cord compression at that time, but it looked like it could be um, progressing. Um, and PET CT showed that he had multiple areas of hypermetabolic uh, lesions, including bulky lung nodules, uh, hyalur adenopathy, uh, calvarian lesions, um, right thyroid bed lesions. Um, and so his question to us was, what to do next? <laughs> I may carry on. So, so the, the approach that you guys took was exactly right, because unfortunately this is the way this always happens. These guys wander through the system, and by the time they see you, they haven't had a CT scan done in three months, or they've been done in <clears throat> sequential order. So at our place, within about a day or two, we would have him entirely imaged from the head to the feet and have identified areas of battles that we need to deal with. Um, you deal with the stuff that's going to hurt him first. Um, external beam radiation, there is a huge literature of using external beam radiation to retinal metastasis. We never hear about it, but there's retinal melanomas. The, these guys, the radiation oncologists know how to do this. There's multiple different techniques. Don't worry about it. When you see one of these, call me because they're rare as hen's teeth, but send it to the radiation oncologist. Um, the brain metastasis we usually deal with next, uh, somewhere between the brain and the spine, depending on where that spine metastasis is. If it's way in the posterior and it's not going to break, that's fine. If it's close to the cord, we deal with that. Doing it exactly the way you did, this takes a multidisciplinary team. So within a day or two, the patient has to see a neurosurgeon, radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, because we're going to need them, neurosurgeon in all likelihood, and figure out some way, we generally do this over the email, since all of us are in the same place, who's going first. Somebody's got to drive the boat here. Um, in our place, that's usually the endocrinologist, because we've traditionally done that. So everything circles in and out of the good Dr. Fish's office, because this is the ones that I give her since she came to be my partner, which is why my life is so good right now. This is, uh, these are not theoretical cases. I think Stephanie sees three or four or five of these a week. Th these are common things that we do. So do the sequence, find out the order that we're there. Um, radioactive iodine, we're done with. Uh, let me ask you this. What's this guy's five-year survival? Is this guy going to die of this? Say yes. Yeah. This is what aggressive, lethal thyroid cancer looks like. This is herthal cell cancer. What's going to happen, no matter what you do, every two months he's going to have new metastatic lesions. You'll use external beam radiation. You'll hold the brain at bay for three months, six months, nine months. It'll break through and it'll regrow. 
um, and then they often develop pulmonary metastasis and, and die. So this is, this is somebody that's going to do very, very poorly. So what I'm trying to think in my head is how can I get these radiated places taken care of, surgery places taken care of, and get him to my medical oncologist while he's still healthy enough to consider one of our clinical trials. Uh, this is not somebody you watch for six months. It's not somebody you keep an eye on. So he's somebody that, that this is what cancer centers are built to do, these multidisciplinary concepts. There's no one person that knows the right answer through this sequence. Um, and so places like MD Anderson can pull this off where you have lots of folks that need to be seen. So that would be the sequence that I would take him through. I agree. I mean, it's sad to me that this patient took four months to get a lung biopsy to prove fertile cell cancer. I mean, you'd have thought an inventive person, given a huge chunk of thyroid tissue in February of 2011, if they measured a thyroid globin, it was 6,776. We could probably have brought in the neurosurgeons in February of 2011 and at least buy some more years. I mean, to put it in perspective, fertile cell cancer is an oddball tumor. And I think if you took the, the Mayo Clinic experience of fertile cell cancer over the years, this gentleman is slightly younger than the average. That's good for him. And he may well die of his neural disease, but he may actually live with it for quite a long while. And if you look at people who are not metastatic with fertile cell cancer in a widely metastatic sense, they may die of old age rather than fertile cell cancer when they're 90. And although they tend to recur in the neck, and they tend to metastasize fairly widely, these people usually live with their lung minutes and don't die of it. But no matter what the astrology is, sadly, if it's not resectable and it's widespread in the brain, that's the likely cause of his demise, and that would be not an unhappy way to go, but the more sad and painful way to go would be his spine. And I think, you know, on the day that we decided to elevenectomy of L1 and L2 in April, I can't help but think the T5 was involved and would a surgeon really be willing to attack two spots in the spine? Should we not have irradiated them back six months ago and only go back into the, the spine if we're really having encroachment despite radiation therapy? I think, as often Mike has said, since he became an oncologist yes. of the thyroid, yes, you know, this notion, oh boy, we found the thyroid, now we better go and do a thyroidectomy and give them radioiodine and then stop and think. I mean, Wait a minute. I mean, if someone's got brain mets and they've got spinal mets, these are much more important than anything we learned in endocrine school, and these are the things that will take the patient out by the end of the year while you're waiting on them to brew up an elevated TSH while the thyrogen vials aren't available. I mean, let's be a bit more imaginative. This is bad disease, but the patient may live with it for quite a while, but unfortunately it's a disease you wish you had found five years ago because by this time I don't think anybody in Sloan Kettering or Mayo Clinic can ever expect to reach uh, a satisfactory conclusion other than attending his funeral, sadly. But it could be a long way away. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. The, the bad prognosis I gave him had to do more with sort of the rapidity of the change, the new places, the mets behind the eye, the mets in the brain. Uh, that's a marker of a herthal cell cancer that's just not going to sit still for 20 years. It's already declared its biologic behavior. It did it day one. So it's not the herthal cell cancer diagnosis. I agree, we got tons of herthal cell cancers that have small lung mets and they're barely positive on the PET scan. And they change slowly over a long time, but not once they do this. When you get the retinal mets, soft tissue mets, mets in weird places, rapidly progressive bone metastasis, if you look in the literature, that's a five-year survival rate of around 50%, probably a little less than that. So it's not the diagnosis per se, it's everything else that followed after that, hence the urgency up front on day one when you hear this. It may have worked out the same way anyway, but you had a better chance if you had gotten to this a little bit earlier on. And as Mike is saying, an older person with heart cell cancer, going to the bother of preparing somebody to give 150 millicuries of radioiodine really should have no place in the first two or three years of this man's treatment if you're really stuck for entertainment radioiodine down the road. But he needs much more dramatic treatments directed to where the problem lies. And as I was suggesting to Mike earlier, you know, we may lose the war in this case, but you can actually choose your battles and potentially protect his quality of life in the spine, save him some months and years by stopping progress in the brain before it becomes critical. And I think you just have to do the best you can by using your team of players to salvage what we can that isn't already gone. And this man has quite a lot of targets we could have treated, 
as of February 2011. It's a pity we're still, you know, planning more treatment almost a year out, sadly. Yeah, so that's basically what we did. We recommended external beam radiation for stabilization of the spine and the brain mats, and um, we, we recommended him for one of our clinical trials, um, which he decided not to go into. Yeah, which is fine. Which is real. Because reasonable. when we would have recommended it for clinical trials, um, is clinical trials going to cure him? No. Is clinical trials going to help him? No? Oh, come on, the MD Anderson guys would be rolling in their grave. We're, we enroll people on clinical trials all the time. So, so what I really tell these folks is that if you're on one of our phase two trials, which is one of the serafinib or sunitinibs or those stuff, we got about a 50 or 60 percent chance of slowing your disease down. And it'll probably last for about a year, a year and a half. So if it works, that's the best it's going to work. All of these drugs make you feel tired. They usually give you diarrhea. They get a little bit of a rash. You get some fatigue. They're not insurmountable, but they'll be able to tell that they're on the drugs. Um, there's a great line from the movie Anchorman. You guys know Anchorman? It's like the greatest line. This guy asked his friend, he said, why do you use that uh, aftershave? Why do, you, it's, why do you use that aftershave? And he said, it, it, it helps me pick up women. And he said that the justification is they've done studies, you know. It works 60% of the time, every time. <laughs> and I challenge you, most people you put on a trial here, it works 60% of the time, every time. It's a real challenge to, to, for these folks that you've been over backwards to help, and now you say, I'm going to put you on experimental trial. They can't imagine you giving them something that might not work, when in fact that's what we're doing. At least half of my patients in this situation choose not to go on my clinical trials. I tell them, fine, I'll still take care of you. Don't go away. We may need to do some more external beam radiation because you're going to have some more bone mets, and we'll help you for that. I don't want you to break an arm or break a leg. We've got wonderful pain control. We've got wonderful palliative care. There are many, many things that we can do to take care of you. So one of the options I would present this guy is the option of best supportive care, pain and palliative care, whatever you want to do it. You're still in my clinic. We still take care of you. There are all the things that we do. But I think it's very reasonable for these guys to choose not to be on these trials as much as I try to load all these guys on our trials. So I think that means you gave him a very fair presentation, and I know how Steve and Maria do this, that they give a very fair presentation about whether the trial would likely to work or not work. Yep. Thank you. So good afternoon, dear, dear colleagues. I'm Dr. Lin from Peking Union Medical College Hospital, and it's my pleasure to be here to share two cases with you. Let's look at case one. Hello, and this is the first case of my case report. Yeah. You're enjoying it. Yeah. Carry on. Ignore my friend. <laughs> and can you read? Then I would not read for you, because my English is not that good. Oh. And can you clear? Make it clear? Okay. You can look at it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then I'll move next one. Okay, so she's she's forty years old. Yeah, forty years old, one female. One centimeter tumor, no radiation. Uh, yeah, no they, family histories. So we do the right side of the thyroid in selective. And select, selective right cervical lymph node reception. And selective. What, do you, what do you mean by selective right cervical lymph node? You may ask our surgeons. Yeah. I just know. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fair. Just, it's just I according, think she speaks pretty good English. It's just calling. A lot better than his Chinese. <laughs> it's just call, maybe just calling uh, the surgeon's feeling during his operation, maybe. A absolutely. So this yeah, is a I'm a nuclear medicine physician. I'm yeah. Not, yeah. I'm, I'm not a surgeon either, but I'm going to tell him what to do. It's, it's important because it turns out in all of these ways they describe neck dissections, no two surgeons agree. They won't even agree on what a modified neck dissection is. So when we read the reports, many times we don't know. So yeah. selective means I plucked out one, <laughs> yeah. or it could mean you got a scar around the back of your neck. Okay. So as we're about to think about what to do, if we knew that she'd had 45 lymph nodes taken out of that neck and none were positive, 
that might be different than if she had one that was done. So we don't know, but we just got. We can see from the pathology result. There you、okay? go. Then let's go. In Chinese. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> May I say that I am a fan of the Japanese literature, even when it's in English. And lobectomy and ipsilateral dissection is the norm in the Ito Hospital and elsewhere. And by George, they do it well, and they do it as well as any American hospital with outcome that we should be all proud of. So I think this is an okay type of surgery. Wow! Anywhere in the world. Wow! Even in yeah, in China, in、Just、China, like we have a diverse operation styles on thyroid cancer.、Right. Yeah. So、huh. this is the pathology result. And after the operation, she was on levothyroxine,、uh, impressive, impressive therapy. And one month later, she was repeated an ultrasound, which revealed that you can see. Then I need your suggestion. Okay. <laughs> Doctor. Dr. Hay said she had a perfectly fine surgery, so I think that's wonderful. So, so we've done a right lobectomy. We've got a one-centimeter papillary. Yeah. They took out at least five lymph nodes it, that were positive for papillary thyroid carcinoma. Two、yeah. were positive. Five. Two. Okay. So two out of five were. It's in Chinese. I can barely read it. <laughs> two out of five. Fantastic. All right. Now I'm with、yeah. you. And so now we've got an ultrasound that shows a left lobe with multiple enlarged lymph nodes and necrosis and casket. Now I understand. So we got nodules on the other side and lots of lymph nodes. You just going to watch this, Doctor Hay? Well, it's a pity they didn't do the damn ultrasound before the first operation. That might have solved this. So what so, do you do? Well, I think it's time to get Doctor Shaha back to do the second operation. Surgery.、Uh, then all the radioiodine in Mass General won't help this one. Yeah,、no. I refuse to. So the patient, <laughs> the patient received a second、uh, operation, and also a selective lymph node resection. Yeah. Twenty-five selected. Yeah. So that that's was, pretty brutal. So I mean, this was absolutely, absolutely the right thing to do. Even in the bad case we saw before, they got multiple doses of radioactive iodine.、Um, radioactive iodine is not a substitute for surgery. Um, the, the, it's unfortunate if she if she'd had a good ultrasound to begin with, she would have probably gotten the right total thyroidectomy、yeah. in that to begin with. But if you do a lobectomy and there you get back cancer and there's nodules in the other side or there's lymph nodes in the other side, you just absolutely have to go back and do the surgery. The, d- you're absolutely right. Using radioactive iodine as a substitute for that to try to kill the lobe or the lymph nodes. The surgeons often want me to do this. These are outside surgeons that don't want to admit they made the wrong decision to begin with and have to go back and do another surgery. I say sorry, should have done it right to begin with. Go do the surgery, get the right thing. If you don't do that, you're going to have persistent changes on the ultrasound. You're going to have persistent lymph nodes. She will eventually get another surgery after you've probably done lots and lots of other things. So、I、agree, absolutely, completely. Yeah. Didn't. Uh, oh, pardon. Why, why was there no biopsy done prior to surgery? Oh, in China,、uh, we seldom do the FNAC. Maybe the pre-、uh, only twenty percent patient received that before operation. That is the status in China. Very special. Yeah. But, but visiting the American Thyroid Association meeting just the other day, I heard a lot of important histologists, cytologists, pathologists talking about what they call in Canada a diagnostic lobectomy. Yeah. Which I think still happens in North America. When in doubt, take it out and then wait five days to find its papillary cancer and then go back and do a second operation. In fact, if this was the dreaded follicular neoplasm, most institutions in America would do a two-part operation. Sadly, if they found cancer, so. All I was really saying was that if you do it properly in Dr. Ito's hospital, you do meticulous ultrasound and you know exactly that you've got a predominantly unilateral disease and you do a unilateral operation, and people do perfectly well despite the possibility they've got a microscopic contralateral disease. But if somebody's got gross disease on both sides of the neck, they need a grossly bilateral operation on day one, ideally, if the Chinese authorities would pay for the needle biopsies. Carry on, my dear. Hold us so far.
<laughs> and what to do next? Whoa. Well, first one's a given. Continuing supp suppressive therapy or radioiodine ablation? Well, the first one's not a discussion point. You've taken out her thyroid. She needs to take thyroid. How much to suppress? Your call. Radioiodine? We could be here for a long time. Yeah. But let's see. She was female. Oh. She was 40. She had disease on both sides and umpteen lymph nodes. Does that kill you? She's going to cheat. So the, the way this always happens is you guys... Yeah, she's going to cheat. The way this always works is they'll eventually tell us there's TG antibodies and the thyroglobulin is 1,000. So the, it's, it's just, I've been on these panels once or twice, so we always go, we would never use it, and then you show a post-therapy scan that's everywhere. So, so the question is, what do you really do? Do I give everybody with lymph node metastasis radioactive iodine? No, by no stretch of the imagination. Um, I do it based on number and size of lymph nodes. If you've got 25 positive lymph nodes and they're three and a half centimeters, that's a very high risk of recurrence. I'm not really certain whether radioactive iodine decreases that risk of recurrence or not, but I'll give you the benefit of the doubt because the risk of recurrence in that setting is 30 or 40 percent. If you've got four or five little millimeter-sized lymph nodes, that is all that little stuff I've been trying to tell you to ignore, some surgeon accidentally takes a little bit of that out, no, I won't give radioactive iodine. If I'm not giving radioactive iodine, I do want to know the pre-op chest x-ray. I do want to know the post-op thyroglobulin, because if the post-op thyroglobulin is 1,000, I just changed my mind. If the post-op thyroglobulin is zero, then I feel more comfortable not giving radioactive iodine. If the TG antibodies are negative, I feel more comfortable, although if they're positive, I don't necessarily do it, because many times they'll come down alone. So in the decision not to give radioactive iodine, it's not just off the PATH report. It's what other information you have post-op that can help make the decision. Dr. Reed, do you use a post-op TG to kind of help you make a decision, and when do you do it? The audience will be surprised to hear that the older fart spent most of his life talking about making predictions based on day one, and the younger fart has just been given a prize for saying that if you wait long enough, you can restage people. It works well. And that's what we do too, meaning on day one or two, we say, this is Macy's 5.1, this is Macy's 3.1, we will send the patient home in thyroid hormone, or we will occasionally give radioiodine. But if we send people home in thyroid hormone, we don't lose them. We check the thyroglobulin at six weeks on thyroid hormone, and if something's fishy, sorry, unusual, <laughs> surprising, then we say, whoops, they'd better come back and see what the hell's happened here, because most people are predictable, but there are occasional troublemakers from China that come in with thyroglobulins of 1,000 and antibodies of 16.33, whatever that might mean. But I guess she was going to give radioiodine, wasn't she? Because she had withdrawn it. She was about to whack it, I think. Or she was maybe depriving the person. Anyway, in a word, carry on, please. We're enjoying yeah. the case. Due to the high uh, TG level, we are suspected the metastasis, maybe this distance metastasis. What, and then, what is an acceptable antibody level in your range? Is that a possible? Uh, zero to 78. So that's... Oh, antibody, you mean? Antibody. Antibody, that is 120. Oh. That is negative, negative antibodies. Yeah. yeah, that is belong to negative antibodies. So there's a surprise in thyroglobulin here. Yeah. yeah. be a long case. Right, so are you guys with us on this thyroglobulin number? Because if we did a total thyroidectomy, we took all those lymph nodes out, the thyroglobulin should be what? Yeah, it'd be zero. It's not really zero, but it's one or two or five. It should be some low-level number, um, especially with this. So when you've got a thyroglobin of 1,000, you're not done. She's got disease somewhere. And so the first thing, you know me, I want to know the size of everything. We go back to that lymph node. We go back to the neck and say, do you have something there? At 1,000, you probably do have distal metastasis because that's very, very high. And in all likelihood, it will be lung metastasis, and hence looking at the lungs is a good idea. But that's why, you know, this decision about whether or not to use radioactive iodine is not totally dependent on the PATH report. It would have made no difference whether I gave her radioactive iodine before she left New York two weeks after the surgery or whether she comes back to the Mayo Clinic in three months and gets it. You've got time to make this decision. So this is the exact opposite of a Herthel cell out of control that I'm screaming, hurry up, do something. In these papillary cancers, I'm screaming, hurry up, don't do anything. Slow down, take a little bit to sort it out. So at 1,000, I would say yes. In all likelihood, we're going to see pulmonary metastasis, um, maybe other distant metastasis, but we'd, we'd expect to light the lungs up on the scan. Yeah. From which we can see the diagnostic 
uh, radio iodine cobalt uh, scan, they only reviewed a thyroid bag uptake and accept that that was normal. And then it is also have a negative chest CT. So what about the dosage of radio iodine run through one? May, may I ask you about your two images on the right? Were these both done pre-therapy? Yeah. And this is uh, pre-therapy. Okay. Double density. Sure, sure. We just want to increase the density to see is there anything abnormal uh, among the these both, both diagnostic scans. Both diagnostic scans, just double density. Yeah. Yeah, we can see very clearly. It gives you a lot of extra background. So we have a 40 year old with a thyroglobin of 1,000 and on a diagnostic radioiodine scan, we don't have any focus of disease outside of the neck at this moment. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And then, with a negative. CT. Do I? Nothing at CT. Yeah, nothing at CT at all. With a, abno uh, with a normal chest CT and a normal, maybe normal. Uh, Diagnostic uh, WBS and only a globulin anemia, high globulin anemia. With that, what can we do about the dosage of the radio iodine one through one? Before Mr. Dosimeter gets involved here, since we don't do that, I mean, I think this would be useful to know what is the uptake in the neck? How avid is this particular remnant? Do you know the quantitative uptake? No, we didn't do that radioactive uh, uh, uptake. See, they don't do North China, I can tell you. We just do that. But and you could. Maybe, you yeah. could. If you were in Paris, there only is one dose here, I think. 100 millicuries. We do it all the time. We do it every yeah. year. We do it until we are tired. <laughs> and, and I've never seen MD was better after 600. Yeah. 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 So what I'm saying is 100 millicuries, I'm thinking, in it's uh, okay. news weave. Yeah. But what's the difference between 150 and 100? Maybe in China. 26.3. Oh, sorry. In China, we use 100, uh, 100 me uh, microcurie for ablative therapy, and for from 100 and 150 to uh, distant, maybe just pulmonary metastasis. So there are some difference. So does Dr. Matsuferi historically and the Mayo Clinic currently? But all I was saying was that if you have a not very great surgeon and who does two operations and you've got a 25% uptake in the neck or a 10% uptake in the neck, I wouldn't like to be looking after that patient if they were given 150 millicuries to 6% uptake in the neck. I mean, yeah. that's a lot of exposure of a lot of tissue. But on the other hand, if it's a smidgen of uptake, a small amount of uptake in the neck, then frankly, whether it's 100, 150, 200, sold, 226, I don't think it much matters. I mean, all you want to do in the first instance is knock out the thyroid and find out what else you find, if anything, with a post-therapy scan. There's something a bit odd about this. So yeah, that's, far. that's where I was a going. A 40-year-old with no post-thyroid disease is a funny thyroid level and check the blood test. Yeah, so we're back to pattern. This is, this is Sesame Street. What doesn't fit here? We're being sold. This is a. Do you love Sesame Street? Yeah. So, do you? Why is it just this table? It's just like. It's just like a Texas thing. Yeah, from ABC and NBC. And the, for the news, that's fantastic. So what's so what's in my head is you got a 40 year old. You're selling this to me as a well differentiated papillary. You got a thyroid globin of a thousand, and you're seeing nothing on the diagnostic scan. There's something wrong with that picture. Um, if this lady has thyroid cancer that's not grabbing onto radioactive iodine, we've got a much much aggressive case or something weird going on, hence Dr. Hayes' comment, is your thyroglobulin right? There are antibodies that make the thyroglobulin falsely elevated. Now, it may well be that she just has microscopic small volume disease in the lungs that we can't see, but boy, to not be able to see that the first time on your first diagnostic scan in a well-differentiated tumor is pretty unusual. So well, we were trying to think about dose, but both of us were thinking, what's wrong with this picture? Um, the reality is I don't know that anybody knows the right dose to give. I think 100 will be as equally ineffective as 150. That's probably perfectly fine. I would caution you from getting above that because this is one of the times that dose symmetry helps you. In those people that have diffuse pulmonary metastasis, if they get a big dose of radioactive iodine, you can hurt the lungs. You know she's not going to get a big dose because her diagnostic scan is negative. 
So even though we light the lungs up with radioactive iodine, hopefully that we'll see it, I'm still going to be concerned that we may not be getting adequate doses in there to be treatment. So in her particular case, at our place, she would get 150. We would just pick out 150 in all likelihood and treat her. Dr. Fish, t we had, yeah. Yeah, we have something called the fish dose that apparently is 125. Is that what she would get? Yeah, at Memorial. Bill, come for me. At, she's going to totally screw up my studies because at Memorial we spent years doing either 100 or 150. We invite her over a year ago and suddenly we're using 125. I have no idea what to do with that. So I would say you'd be perfectly safe anywhere between 100 and 150. Anybody that tells you they know the answer is not telling you the truth. So I think you're well within a safe range there. But as a general point to endocrinologists in any part of their practice, independent of the thyroid, one thyroglobulin's fishy, sorry, needs to be repeated. I mean, to pursue some aggressive course when things don't fit, yep. maybe there's something wacky going on in the thyroglobulin lab. Maybe somebody doesn't like this lady. It was my other I mean, it's lot. bizarre. I mean, even the Mayo Clinic, occasionally things go wrong in the lab. Uh, but I would, ha you know, I'd, were you at the French trial that was reported as one of the key papers the other no, day by no, Schlumberger? No, no, no. He didn't me. Were you fellows uh, privy to the, the, the eight best abstracts or the four best abstracts, clinical versus basic? To my recollection, reading the abstract, because I may have been golfing, um, Dr. Schlumberger told us that with recumbent TSH or withdrawn, with low dose or high dose, you get similar results. And all I'm trying to say is that, you know, because of the wacky laws of the United States, until recently, this person in China could be treated with 29.9 millicuries, and Dr. Kluse and Matt Seferi think that's still okay too. So whether it's 30, 50, 75, 85, 100, 125, 150, <laughs> for God's sakes, why would we be treating some miserable little piece of normal thyroid tissue with the same stuff you whack brain mats with? It doesn't make sense. I don't believe in the symmetry or the holy whatevers, but, you know, what I'm saying is give the punishment to fit the crime. And this patient, if they've got 10% uptake in the neck, might get by with 30 millicuries, least of all a Chinese $100 versus 150. I think it's for the birds. Is there a for a pet scan? Not in China. So, the, the question is, is there, is there a role we for We have the, a pet scan, yeah. Oh, in the later, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So if, if I really believe that thyroglobulin of 1,000, which means I've repeated it 13 times, um, it, it is such an unusual case to be in this situation to have a young person like this to be markedly pet positive. I would say right now, no. I would go ahead and give uh, a diagnostic, uh, give a therapeutic dose primarily to see the post therapy scan. If I don't see anything on the post therapy scan and that thyroid globin number is this high, then I would do a pet scan. So this is, this is one of those odd cases where neither one of us are yet convinced that we're doing a lot based on a single number here. Uh, so I would start with just 100, 150, see what the post-therapy scan shows. If I don't see anything on the post-therapy scan and the TG is really high, then I probably would do a PET. I have the same question. Uh, I have the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I think knowing the uptake would be helpful here. Yeah. Because, you know, do you need 100 millicuries if at the end of the day all we're treating is the completion of the thyroidectomy in the neck and this patient doesn't have disease outside of the neck? But I fear this is going to go on for some pages and there's some badness outside of the neck. I suspect you're right. Carry on, yeah. please. What did you choose? Oh. Oh, you can't believe that. And we, we look at, <laughs> we look at the Bible. <laughs> Next slide. Yeah. From the Bible, maybe the patient is just... From the Bible. <laughs> yeah. From this, the patient may be just a selective for radioiodine therapy. Just a selective recommendation, not a clearly recommendation. Oh, no, no. no? Wait, 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 wait. He wrote that. Okay. <laughs> he is the Holy I, I think that's one of the best sentences I've ever seen in my life. Okay. So we negotiated for six months for that. The, we have to be clear what the word selective means. With selective doesn't mean right or wrong. Selective means what you heard the two of us just go through. What's the size of the lymph nodes? What's the thyroid globulin afterwards? Because it says if, if the combination of features ends up as high risk, if that thyroid globulin is 1,000, I don't care whether this was a 2 millimeter papillary or a 35 centimeter papillary, that changes things. So in that selective group, it says there are people like this that sometimes I do treat, sometimes I don't. If her yeah. thyroid globulin was zero, I would select not to give her a dose radioactive iodine. 
If it's a thousand, I would select two to use the dose rate. You mean the recurrence risk stratification according to the risk uh, recurrence? Yes. But you didn't you, you didn't write that down on your recurrence stratification about that high glimo. You you can see that because the high risk patient. Yeah. No, 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 I'm not and done yet. No, 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 He's no, out. no, I am so not out. Read number four. What's number four say? That's what that, that's what that sentence means. So, that was, <laughs> so, so the reason we put that one in there was for this situation. Now, I, to be fair, we didn't define it. Because God knows we couldn't agree on what a number was. But we put that number four in there exactly for this kind of case, that it was above 4,000. So she, she would qualify in the ATA as high risk because that TG is out of proportion. But not. The TG, uh, the high globulinemia out of the uh, proportion to what is seen in a post-treatment scan, not pre Ah. Yeah, that is the pitfall. Yeah. <laughs> so that is the pitfalls. So according to. Nicely done. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Why are you doing this? <laughs> In America, we pick on the presenters. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so according to your Bible. We choose a uh, we choose a uh, hundred millicurie uh, radio iodine dosage, yes. and then unfortunately we see that the increased uptake among both pulmonary area. So this give me uh, a big hit, maybe that maybe uh, ATA is something wrong. Yeah. Whoa. Hey, wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen. She's next going to attack the Macy's scoring system. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and after this result, told, told my patient, she was also give her a shock. shock. Oh, my, oh, my, uh, oh, my God. My son says that, oh, my Lady Gaga. <laughs> oh, my yeah. Lady Gaga. So the patient cannot the patient cannot believe that. <laughs> so, then she receive a PET scan, FDG PET scan. But the PET, PET CT F, uh, FDG scan is uh, negative. That means very lower uh, metabolic. Correct. Yeah. So maybe PET scan is not that useful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if on if I'd have seen the post therapy scan that was positive. I would yeah. not have done a PET scan on her. I agree with you totally. Because now you've got a thyroid globin that's actually proportional to the post-therapy scan. Yeah. A stimulated thyroid globin in the hundreds or about a thousand was okay, because your TSH was 80. That was okay for what you were seeing on the diagnostic scan. So yes, I would have stopped and not done the PET scan. So I agree with you totally. Yeah. I love this case. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Wait a minute. <laughs> but. It only goes to show, if you can't see the bloody thing with the diagnostic scan, and it takes a hundred millicues to see the damn thing, what's the risk to this woman in her life if she's got invisible disease? I mean, wait a minute, we're going to hit it with another bigger dose in a minute, just in case it gets away from us, but uh, mm. carry on. And now the present status about the patient. Yeah. Did we get a second one? Uh, not, uh, then, this is the present status of this patient, case one. What is that? And this is to summarize from this, our, our this case. The lessons from this patient may be inadequate after first surgery. I think maybe due to the pre-operation evaluation. Female, uh, a, quite, a quite good age, and one centimeter. He is to blame. <laughs> so, this may be may blind our surgeons about that, and also inadequate radio iodine iodine therapy may be inevitable according to present guideline of Sarah's cancer. Yeah.
we'll, we'll fix this for you. So, yeah, it's, I think it's absolutely a true statement. So when, when we're doing sort of who to select for and not using radioactive iodine, we should have it clearly written that we're using that post-operative thyroid globulin without the post-therapy scan, you know, in addition. So I, you're absolutely right, and we'll fix that on this next time around. Because clearly when we're doing risk stratification, we are using the suppressed TG. Some places use a stimulated TG to make that decision about whether or not to ablate. So we will make that more clear. Because that clearly, the reason this lady, everybody in this room would have treated her was that 1,000 thyroid globulin. Um, the other thing that always worries me about this is when, when these folks, if I can't see the uptake on the diagnostic scan and you only see it on the post-therapy scan, Rich Robbins used to refer to this as high-dose scanning, that you may not be getting a therapeutic effect and that these guys often get two or three doses. The post-therapy scan is still positive, although a little better each time, and at some point you quit giving them radioactive iodine and they do fine back to Dr. Hayes' point, that they may have done fine all along without that. So I always worry about these guys. When you see this setting, it is really unusual to make their thyroid globulin zero, even though the scan is positive, because I worry that we're not getting adequate lesional dosimetry. So I think your points are well taken. Oh. But to return to our original old nonsense that we're talking about, this patient had extensive disease in the neck, bilateral nodes. Now we've done a miraculous thing by making the scintigraphic slate of invisibility disappear and the thyroglobin's going down. But the patient still could come back next year at year four, six, eight, and ten with lymph nodes that haven't been destroyed by radioiodine because the radioiodine, 99% of it went straight through the body and a smidgen of it went to the chest lesions, which were so tiny but fortunately so well differentiated that they gobbled up the radioiodine eventually. But, you know, I... I think there's an awful lot of ladies out there who have invisible microscopic disease and what I'm saying here is the thyroglobin of a thousand, quite honestly, in the bigger picture of China's economy, probably does a, does a disservice because I don't think this lady is going to suffer from this invisible disease that we've now whacked with three doses of radioiodine, done God knows how many PET scans and went to America on a free flight. I don't know, but worst is to follow. The next case is a struma. <laughs> <laughs> but ten minutes to run! Oh. I'm sorry. Maybe the lessons from this is just we only know that the, this patient is uh, ascribed to a high-risk uh, recurrence strat, uh, group after his, her first therapy. No, that's not true. The, the fact that she had a thousand before you did your diagnostic scheme. We are looking forward to your writing it in the future, a guideline. I write these on Saturday nights at 9 o'clock. I'm with you. <laughs> Nobody pays me to do this in today. So, yeah, I, we'll clarify that. But the, the logic of this is she was a high risk as soon as you got a thousand. Yeah. Now, a high risk for what? We're not certain. But we'll clarify that because logically that's the way we think about that. Even at the Mayo Clinic, there's still a reason he brings these guys back in three or four months and measures that thyroid globulin to see where we are. So it will be more clear about how we're doing. I think one of the things we will clarify in the guideline this year is how you select. Okay. We don't really say how you select. So I think, you know, a certain number of lymph nodes, it'll be a huge argument. So it's, it's hard to get two of us to agree with ourselves. But I think one of the things we're going to try to do is be a little bit more clear about how we select. And, and that post-op thyroid globulin will come into that for you. And this case also enlightened us to write an uh, article, a retrospective article about pre-ablative stimulated TG, which uh, a poster in this session. So we think this, we, we should recall a pre-ablative thesis meaning for predicting the distance metastasis. Yeah. So thank you for this case. Can, can, we, can we not encourage her? Okay, that was slightly painful. Stop encouraging her. <laughs> She's going to do it to me again. Go ahead. Fortunately, there are no guidelines in Struma of IE. And this, this is the Any other patient data. In this case, before we move to the curiosity case, no? Any more questions? Do they do dosimetry in China? Cheeky. <laughs> they, oh. they don't do dosimetry most places in the United States. Um, and, and it's really, I mean, everybody talks about dosimetry. It's cool. I think I can do it. It's fun. Um, you can probably count on one hand the number of times each month Dr. Fish and I actually do dosimetry. We give a lot of radioactive iodine without it. There's a small group of patients we think it may help, uh, but there's really no data that the outcomes, if you look in the Bible, 
The, it says we can't tell you whether to do it empirically or with dosimetry. The best data we have is not dosimetry. It's Cosimo Durante and Schlumberger's work. All the data we quote that radioactive iodine works in distant metastasis done without dosimetry, fixed small doses. So don't feel bad if you can't do dosimetry. Yeah. How bad can a stimulated thyroglobin be from an incomplete surgery? Uh, do you know that? Quite high. You probably see more of those than I do. I, I would, a thousand would be off my radar screen. I, I would think that would oh, be really high. Maybe as high as seven thousand. Well, I guess it depends on how bad the total thyroidectomy is. So yeah. it, it depends. Uh, it, it honestly, it depends on how much normal mm -hmm. tissue is left, which is why Dr. Hay wanted to know the percent uptake. Uh, a thousand would be high for us, but we know. And uh, add something. In China, we did not do uh, dose uh, dosimetry. We just used a fixed dose. Maybe in the future, we, we need iodine one, two, four patch scan. We can do something maybe later. Okay. And this is the next case. Can you see clear? A Chinese English? Yeah. At the end of this case, we're all going to feel bad. Okay. And this patient do a, a PET scan here, yeah. Because most of Chinese doctors like PET scan, FDG PET scan. They can, they, they're sure maybe PET can help everything. But this is not, yeah. But even, but even here in the United States, it's not, because we don't know this is any kind of thyroid cancer yet. Even our pulmonary doctors, very frequently, their first step will be a PET scan to evaluate nodules. Because yeah. apparently it helps them figure out which ones are cancer or not cancer. Yeah. So even here, this scenario of having multiple pulmonary nodules and then having a PET scan would be a common outcome. Yeah. yeah. And then, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm. And she had a lung biopsy through the thoracoscopy. And this is the pathological results. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, exactly. So, I, I no longer trust you. So, um, <laughs> I love you. You're fantastic. The, this is why I do this. So, so what do you do? So, you've got biopsy-proven lung disease. Common things being common, what's the first thing we do? Look at the thyroid. Uh, now, if you're really desperate, you can actually feel the thyroid with your hands. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, there's a lot of things we can order, but every once in a while you can just feel the thyroid. Here was an ultrasound. So we, we already did a negative ultrasound. Yeah, I'm still fairly much a non-believer. Yeah. So in the situation where we've got pulmonary metastasis, even when the thyroid uh, is negative on the ultrasound, in all likelihood I'm going to tell them to take the thyroid out because I will assume that there's some microscopic, lymph node, or microscopic metastatic disease in there. The, I need the thyroid out anyway if I'm going to use radioactive iodine. This is a well-differentiated follicular tumor. Um, I don't normally rush down and look in the pelvis unless I'm on one of these panel discussions. So in all likelihood, what would really happen is we would say, go ahead and take the thyroid out, and we do a radioactive iodine scan. Fortunately, there was a visiting medical student from Sloan Kettering in Pekin, and they took a history. They took a history and there was gynecologic surgery 16 years ago. And what do you think it was for? You reveal every answer. I cannot stop. <laughs> Continue again. I, I am playing legitimately along with you, okay? A benign stroke. <laughs> oh, oh, so, are you hiding information from me? <laughs> there's, some past, the next line, there's, there's, more there's some past medical history you're like not telling me about here? <laughs> no. Okay. So, so go ahead. Okay. And what's that scar for? An appendix? No. <laughs> so the, the neck ultrasound was no abnormal on steroid, and also a normal level of steroid hormone and antibodies. What to do next? What was the TG? Thyroid No. 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 Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. You have one. A number. Oh. I'm sorry to, to, I didn't take the concrete number, but it's negative. I'm sorry about that. Because I'm... Okay, keep going. Okay. And then this, 
maybe remind us just for some ectopic steroid malignancy. So the, uh, we, which, uh, we asked the patient one more, and she recalled that a pre previous benign stroma ovary over the left ovary 16 years, 16 years ago. So a malignant, a malignant stroma ovary, MSO, was suspected. And how about the next management? Yeah, so these, these are rare tumors, but uh, we've seen, I guess, 15 or 20 of them that are, are been, uh, were stromovaries, so ectopic thyroid tissue that arise in the ovary um, that have the bad luck every once in a while to develop well-differentiated papillary carcinoma. The natural history of them is sort of local regional metastasis. They tend to metastasize to the peritoneum, to the abdomen. If they're big, sometimes they have lymph node metastasis around the ovary. They like to be on the liver, in the liver, um, occasionally lung and occasionally bone. So if you get this history, you're going to go back and do a pelvic ultrasound, have the GYN doctors take a look and see, do you have any recurrent disease down there? Um, you're going to get the old pathology slides if you can, which might be difficult from 16 years ago. It's probably not going to change a lot about what you're going to do because she's still going to have to have her thyroid taken out to do radioactive iodine, so you're still going to move in that direction. But if I had that history, then I would do some sort of pelvic imaging to see if there's any persistent residual disease, mass disease that need to be taken care of with surgery before I gave radioactive iodine. Uh, at that time, she was in the gynecology department, and she also received a pelvic ultrasound and re revealed nothing. Okay. Sorry for my inadequate information. Yeah. And then this patient was referred for our, uh, to our department for further radio iodine therapy. Can we directly down this? Can we directly? Done this? Yes, yeah, so the question is, can you go ahead and use radioactive iodine? Um, the traditional answer is no, because you need the thyroid taken yeah. out to be able to give radioactive iodine. Now, I, I've had two of these patients that just absolutely refuse to do that, and so I said, I'll do a diagnostic scan to prove to you that it don't work, and by and large, their lung mets lit up, their parabdominal mets lit up. It was so well differentiated, it actually competed with the normal thyroid. Yeah. So if I, if I had my preference, I would tell her you should do a total thyroidectomy, get the normal thyroid out of there, so that this, this, this tumor tends to be a very, very well-differentiated cancer. It responds to radioactive iodine, kind of like pediatric thyroid cancer. These thyroid globulins melt away, the, the abdominal metastasis melt away. So I would, if she was my family, I'd say take the thyroid out and then give a dose of radioactive iodine. Which is certainly what we've done. But uh, as you were saying, I think... If these patients have bulky disease in the thorax or in the abdomen, you need a combined approach of significant gynecologic surgeons and thoracic surgery. But the radioiodine does wonderful things for small disease in the lung in this circumstance, but the thyroid has to go and is usually an innocent victim. Next Thank page. You. No radioiodine yet. Yeah. And then we did uh, recommend that the patient should do a total thyroidectomy because we think that uh, uh, intact thyroid organs will, uh, will maybe uh, prevent our radioiodine to further its target. Yeah. Then after the total thyroidectomy, the patient would receive a 150 millicurie re uh, radioablative therapy. And this is the Sorry. Well, and this is the uh, post therapy Hobart scan. We can see increased density in the post pulmonary area. And this is the second time uh, at an interval of six months later. This is also a post therapy, post uh, uh, radio iodine therapy Hobart scan. We can see it gradually re uh, recovered. Oh, sorry. And the present status of this patient. And uh, the stimulated uh, seroglobulin is also raised pre uh, the first uh, radioiodine therapy. Yeah. And the 
It also she had a reduced stimulated TG from uh, 282 to 1.5. Yeah. So this is this is very typical for metastatic stream of error this way. It's why we push so hard to have the thyroid taken out. I give a lot of people radioactive iodine that I know in my heart of hearts is going to do marginally good, if anything. Uh, this is not that case. This is a case that I know we're going to do some good with radioactive iodine. Our traditional approach is not to give a second dose at six months. We give one dose, and then I follow the suppressed thyroid globulins every three months. Many times they will continue to go down for a year, year and a half, or two yeah. years. So the, it's certainly fine. The, the, everybody says to repeat a dose at some interval. Six months would be the earliest, and it's actually what Steve Larson and our nuclear medicine group likes. They like to repeat at six months. I tend to be a little more conservative. I'm amazed how well radioactive iodine works, and you can watch these things shrink for a long time. So I tend to give one dose and then sit back and watch for about a year and a half, and when the TG naters out, gets flat, which is usually 18 months down the road to give a oh, second dose. Uh, yeah. But this approach is perfectly fine. On her, when, when do you repeat the dose, if it works? I mean, in the usual, you know, older patient with more significant metastasis, I think we're impatient because we think time is short relatively, so we look at six months. And it amazes me how many patients you see sent in where people give a dose and wait a year or two to check, because I think that's going the other extreme. But in this circumstance, we're dealing, after all, with invisible disease like the first case, and if we wait a year, I think that's acceptable. Because I think part of the problem when we get carried away in giving big doses of radioiodine is big dose didn't seem to work, given a bigger, bigger dose, and we keep on precipitating this at very short intervals. That's the way to give people leukemia and bone marrow problems. <laughs> and yeah. I think enough's enough. But I guess you went for a third dose to complete the job. I think this is a, when you come to your next slide, it's gratifying, as you're saying. Surprise, surprise, you and I are going to end up this two-hour session by saying radioiodine works here and it makes lung mats disappear. Albeit, these lung mats are pretty tiny and if it wasn't so dramatic a case in its presentation, perhaps this patient, like the first case, would live forever despite her lung metastasis for microscopic nature. It's a, it's a blessing and a surprise to me this patient has no disease left behind after all these years and magically it took yeah. 10 plus years to become pseudo-invisible in the lungs. It's an odd case. Yeah, and also this patient is a follicular carcinoma. It is very rare. Depends and after six true. years, from just a, a total, maybe uh, he had a complete uh, left, left ovary dissection. And then how come? It transferred from a follicular to a follicular carcinoma. It is very yeah, I, rare. I don't, most, of the, most of the time when we review those slides in the ovary, um, we call them follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinomas. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the nature of these metastatic lesions can look funny. Even classic papillaries can look follicular in a bone. They can look follicular in the yeah. lung. So I don't think it transforms. Yeah. It's just and from our whole body scan, we, cannot, we, we didn't see any abnormal apathic over the pelvic area. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, this, but it would be no different than, it, it would yeah. be no different if you did a total thyroidectomy and years later they developed small volume pulmonary metastasis. I suspect she had these small volume pulmonary metastasis before they took yeah. out the ovary and it was just below the radar screen for many years. Maybe. Uh, so I think I still see this as sort of more of a persistent disease issue. Hard to explain why it would suddenly be new. So I like the unified theory. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.